I'm going to do something I probably have never done before. Um, I'm going to address the situation through this message because I believe it's completely appropriate uh, that our country's in right now. I'm going to tell you uh, what I believe the Bible says about it. And then I'm going to charge you to have the courage to, in spite of what you may feel, in spite of what you may know, to help yourself and those around you to live to the charge of God's word. Make sense? So uh, stay with me for the journey. I'm asking you ahead of time for grace. I may say some things that may offend you. I may some, say some things that may challenge you. But do me a favor. Before you write me off and stop watching or before you decide whether or not you want to be here and not be here, follow me to the end. And if at the end of this message you don't see Jesus, then please, by all means, do what you feel you need to do. Amen? Um, our key scripture for the last several weeks as we've been approaching the Pentecost Sunday has been Acts chapter 2. And it starts by saying this, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. In other words, there's a time. It's not always going to come when we want it, how we'd like to come, how we'd like it to come, but there's a time. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Bible says this, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. One sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to bring out a couple of things before I start my message today, and that's that the Bible says that they were all in one accord and in one place. When was the last time you got together with your family and you guys all were in one accord? I'm not talking about a Honda. I'm talking about an agreement. Seems like we can't agree what movie we want to watch. The biggest argument we have as a family, we have every Sunday after church. Where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? Can't ever seem to be in one accord. See, God only sends his breath where his body is in. How is it that we could ever expect the presence of God to descend when as a body we can't seem to be on the same page? Our country's hurting. Our country's in a real bad spot. And we're all deciding what side we're on. I'm going to pick this side. Well, I feel this way. Well, I feel that way. And I'm going to ask you this. As long as you're on the side you feel most connected with, you can't be on his side. And I feel that today we've got to find a place. Because if I'll be honest with you, if I can just be honest with you. If you don't know, this might be a shock to you. But I'm a minority. I'm Hispanic. I speak to a lot of Hispanics. And they all feel the pain. But nobody has an answer. My two dearest friends in my whole entire life have been African American. My two closest friends my whole life. African American. I speak to them heartfelt, sincere pain. I can feel their pain, but nobody has an answer. I have Caucasian friends all over the country. Godfather to my sons. Not just acquaintances, friends. And I ask them. And everybody feels the pain, but nobody has the answer. So today, before you choose to side with your pain, take this journey with me. And perhaps, perhaps the Bible might have the answer we've been looking for. George Floyd, Minneapolis, murdered by an entity we trust to protect us. Eric Gardner, New York, murdered by an entity we trust to protect us. Both of them said something that was so profound, I don't think that America has realized the impact of their words. Both of them before their lives were brutally yanked from existence. They uttered these words. Are you ready? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I want to suggest to you that I don't think it was a coincidence. I don't think that COVID-19 and this uproar that we're experiencing at this specific time is a coincidence. 
I believe anything that happens on earth is first happened in heaven. And I believe that God is paying attention because I don't believe it was just Mr. Floyd. I don't believe it was just Mr. Gardner. Matter of fact, I want to suggest to you today that the world at large is saying the very same things that these two men are saying. I can't breathe. I believe we've reached a point in America where the pain is so big. The divide is so big. I, I honestly believe if you ask Congress, how are you feeling, they're going to tell you. They're honest. I can't breathe. I, I think if you ask preachers and pastors and caseworkers and people across the country, what are you going to do? What are you feeling? I think the echo in America today is I can't breathe I want to address this word today I feel for the next few minutes God has something to say about the lack of breath that we're experiencing today the world is asphyxiating at its attempt to be politically correct when all the while it doesn't recognize how desperately it needs to be biblically correct it's not PC it's going to save our country. It's BC. We need to worry less about being politically correct and more about being biblically correct. When the world started, it started in Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, the Bible says that Adam laid inanimately, inanimately on the ground. Until God breathed into Adam, and then Adam came alive. Adam was not alive until the breath of God breathed into him. The word breath, the imagery behind the word is often used to convey spiritual essence, power, unseen except in, in its effects. So, so when it talks about the Holy Spirit's work, it's talking about breath. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, the word breath is often interchanged with the word spirit and wind. Does that make sense? So God had breathed into Adam and gave him life, but under a tree, somebody say under a tree. Under a tree, Adam and Eve had a conversation with Satan. Satan convinced them that his way was better than God's way. Watch this. And when he did, they exhaled what God had inhaled into them. When Adam and Eve found themselves without the breath of God, Adam's choice would eventually lead to the very sin that would become the seed of racial indifference. See, there's so much indifference whether it's racial or in other aspects, but the seed is the same. Are you ready? It comes from hate. Hate. Racism comes from hate. Hate comes from the enemy. And the enemy got it to us by getting Adam to exhale the breath of God, to release the breath of God. And you may say, Pastor Eli, how do you know that? Because the Bible says that when Adam ate of the tree, he died. You and I know he continued to live. What died in him? What died in him was the breath of God. And he began to live his own breath. What happens when we exhale what God put inside of us and it begins to dissipate from the heart of humanity? I'll tell you what happened. Sin with its attributes, its behaviors, and its outcome becomes the tale of who we are. Pastor Eli, what are you talking about? How does Cain find a way to kill his brother? I'll tell you why. Because Cain like his father was absent of the, of the breath of God. How does Abraham lie to protect himself and make his wife vulnerable? I'll tell you how a man does that when he's absent of the breath of God. How does Isaac, his own son, repeat the same thing that his father did? I'll tell you how, because he's absent of the breath of God. How is it that Jacob steals from those who are most close to him? Can I say how? Because he's absent of the presence of God. How does the first king of Israel who gets in power and authority and is blessed and honored by God, how does he lose it all and get swallowed up with pride? Because he lost the breath of God. 
How does our favorite king, the young warrior who killed Goliath, the young man who won the hearts of the country and the favor of God, how does this young man become an adulterous murderer? I'll tell you how. Because he lost the breath of God in his life. That's how he did it. And I want to say to you, we must not allow the church of God to be void of the breath of God. We have to desire to breathe again. From that moment, there would be moments in life where we would experience short bursts of the presence of God. Short exhales. Short exhales. Pastor, you're like, what, what do you mean? Do you remember when, when Noah... When Noah was saved from the Ark of the Covenant, excuse me, when he was saved from the flood, it was a breath of God. God said, I know know that that flood is coming, but I'm going to preserve you and I'm going to save you. You remember when Egypt had to release Israel and Israel was taken from bondage? Do you remember that? And here they are trying to get away from the bad, but bad is chasing them. You ever felt like you tried to live right and make good decisions, but the bad is chasing you? Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. You're trying to get out of that life, but that life won't leave you alone. And here they are between Egypt coming back for them and the Dead Sea. What happens at that very moment when the Bible says that Moses raises his staff? Do you remember? The Bible says a wind comes. What is the wind? The wind is the breath of God that comes in the very moment when the past is trying to get to you. And the Bible says the wind of God blows into that Red Sea, separates that Red Sea, and lets Israel pass and the enemies get caught up. Just a glimpse of what it's like to have the breath of God. Somebody say a glimpse. What was it that withheld the properties of fire to consume Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? I'll tell you what it was. It was the breath of God. What stayed the natural instinct of the lion to destroy and eat Daniel in that lion's den? I'll tell you what it is. It was the breath of God. Here's an unfortunate reality. That even though God would show up with moments of his breath, we always fell back to the same mess we came out of. You know why? Because we didn't have the breath of God, we had spurts of breath, short exhales. Does that make sense? Anybody capturing that with me? We lose the breath of God. And all of a sudden, stay with me, man, because it's about to get there. We become the dictators of what forgiveness is and what racism is. As long as forgiveness and racism remains exclusively defined by our experience, by our intent, listen to me clearly, our country can never be healed. As long as you get to be the one who dictates what forgiveness is and on what terms you'll be forgiven, as long as you are the one who dictates how and what love is. How and what racism is. Come on, just, be, just follow me for a minute. I shared with you just a minute ago, I am Hispanic. I am Hispanic. And if you think that I have not experienced racism, you are mistaken. I was raised in the fields of farm worker boy in, in, in uh, Fresno, California. I experienced things at schools. Yes, I was the one eating uh, uh, milk, drinking milk from the powdered box that was black, wh- white box with black writing. Yes, peanut butter came in a can that you had to open like this. Yes, we had cheese that went in the microwave and never melted. And we stood in line for it. Yes, I came to Yakima, put my kids in private school and still felt racism. Yes, in the, in, in, as we pastored Changing Point Church and we began to grow, do you know that I had people come who were Caucasian, who loved the way we preached and loved to see people get saved? And here's what they said to me. Eli, we want to support your church. We want to stay with you. But you got to speak more to us. What do you mean? Yeah, you got to look a little bit more like us. you got to tell stories about the things that interest us. I said, the story of Jesus isn't enough. Because it comes packaged in this, I'm not enough. 
There are moments in my life like moments in your life. I could tell you stories about the Hispanic community. You could tell me stories about the Asian community. You could tell me stories about the African American community. The fact is that racism is alive and well in this great country. The problem with that is that as long as you're holding the definition of forgiveness, then a white man has no chance of reconciliation. Oh, I know, I know, I know. We want to dictate what racism is because you're too endowed with privilege that you could never know the racism that you have. When, please just follow me, when did it become okay for us to begin to judge other people's hearts? When did it become okay for us to hold in our hand the baton that says whether or not you're genuine or disingenuous? I'll help you out. I'm not saying that anybody is right or anybody is wrong. That's not what I'm saying. Can I take you for just a moment to the words that Jesus said on the cross? I'm going to take you all the way back in just a minute. But let me start with this word. Do you know that one of the very first things that Jesus said on the cross, are you with me? Watch this. Father, forgive them. Are you ready? Because they don't know what they're doing. The model of forgiveness given to us by Jesus was not one where the perpetrator was expected to understand. I know, I know, I wish everybody understood my pain. I wish everybody understood the struggle. I wish everybody understood so that maybe, perhaps, but as long as we depend on humanity's ability to make things right, things will never become right. What keeps us separate is we want to choose what is racism and we want to choose what is forgiveness. And I'm here to tell you that if we're ever going to get healed, you and I have to let go. We have to let go of what we think is right and start moving towards what Bible, the Bible and the Word of God says is right. I hope that helps. You know what? If we continue to be the ones, if we continue to be the ones who holds on to unforgiveness the way we want to see it, or hold on to racism the way we want to see it, then we will be like Cain who kills his brother, or Noah who curses his son, or like Abraham, I mentioned to you, who lies to protect himself. You and I do not want to be counted among those people. We don't want to be accounted among those people. Eli, what is the answer? The answer is you and I must become hungry for the breath of God. And I know perhaps within your heart you would say, Eli, I'm here. I know you're here, and I'm going to address the believer in just a moment. But I want to show you how Jesus, how God has planned our, our life for us. Already, I want to show you how this moment didn't catch God off guard. Matter of fact, he starts sowing seeds in the hearts of Israel about what is to come. And he did it in a really unique story in the book of Ezekiel. And so he, he knew that one day we would start being hungry for the breath of God. And so he gives us a glimpse of what is to come. And he does this in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. We're going to start at verse 4. It said, again, he said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will lay sinew upon sinew and I will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put, bre put breath into you and you shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God so I prophesied as I was commanded and so I prophesied and there was a noise behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to its bone and when I beheld lo sinew that's another way of saying tissue sinew and the flesh came upon them and skin covered them Skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy to the wind. Come on, what I say was the breath of God? The wind, right? Prophesy to the wind. Son of man, say to the wind. Thus saith the Lord God from the four winds. O breath, and breathe upon the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath came to them. And they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. And they said to me, son of man, these bones, uh, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off 
from our parts. Therefore prophesy to them, thus saith the Lord. Behold my people, I will open graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is a vision. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. It was a vision. Here's what the vision was. God takes one man into a valley of dry bones. One man into where there used to be life. Come on, listen to me. One man into where there used to be an army. One man into where there used to be power. But all that's left is a memory of what could have been. A memory of what should have been. And I got to be honest with you, as I hear the words of Martin, Key, Martin Luther King Jr., I think now that he would have been 91 years old, should have there been something different from the result of that life? Should there be something different today? As a matter of fact, I want to say to you, I feel like there is a valley in our country that needs to come alive again. I feel like there is an army in our country that needs to come alive again. But we don't know how to, watch this, come on, stay with me, man. We don't know how to put flesh on it. We feel the pain and we feel the hopelessness of this racism and separation, but nobody has an answer. How do you, how do you put flesh on this army? How do we gather and not destroy? How do we build up and not tear down? I don't know how. But here's what God said. He said, listen to me. You prophesy. Let the wind come. And when the wind come, he's going to begin to put pieces back together that you and I can never put back together. And so you know what he said? He said, I went out there. I went out there and I stood where there was no life. I stood where there was no hope. And I didn't look to the political system. I didn't look to my own abilities. I didn't look to my strength. I prophesied to the breath of God. And I said, breath of God, come. You know what the picture is? The picture is that one day somebody would come who would not just talk about the pain, who would not just hear about the pain, but who would stand in the middle of the valley and prophesy. Can I suggest to you that over 3,000 years later, somebody showed up and that somebody was Jesus Christ and Jesus stood in the middle of the valley of dead bones. He stood in a place where religion lost its power. He stood in a place where people had lost its power, where politics had lost its power, but he stood there in a dead valley and he prophesied. The preview that was given in Ezekiel was executed on the cross of Calvary and delivered on the day of Pentecost. That day in the day of Pentecost, when, God, let me just back this up for a minute. The Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross, he said a couple of things. I shared one of them with you a minute ago. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is an image to us, an example, that forgiveness needs to stop waiting on the other person's ability to earn it. If you keep waiting for your spouse to earn forgiveness, you'll never forgive him. If you keep waiting on your spouse to earn it, you'll never forgive her. Jesus gave us the model that you don't forgive people who earn it. You forgive people who don't even know what they're doing. It's tough, huh? Come on, that's tough. I forgive you. You don't even know what you're doing. You should know what you're doing. Well, you can have breath or you can have death. And how you get that is on how you determine you will or will not forgive. He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. But you know what else he said? He said, Father, I thirst. He said, this is your brother. This is your brother. But when he was done speaking, the Bible said that he breathed his last breath. What God started in Genesis and Abraham lost under a tree Jesus came over 5,000 years later under another tree and he reignited what the Father had released. He released the breath of God. And I'm here to tell you the only thing that's going to heal our country, the only thing that's going to bring reconciliation, it's not politics, it's not policies, it's a church that is hungry for the breath of God. <laughs> the 
The Bible said that Jesus breathed his last breath and for 40 days that breath hovered over humanity. Pastor Eli, what are you talking about? Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the Spirit of God. Why did the Spirit of God hover over the earth? Because he was waiting for 120 people to get in one accord. What's going to change the world and empower the breath of God when the church of the living God isn't worried about what I look like, what people see me? Is my Instagram page growing? Are people making me popular? When we worry more about the breath of God, the breath of God will fall on us. I started Changing Point Church in 1996, 98, as Family Worship Center. One of the things that we were known for is that we would gather frequently 30 and 40,000 pounds of food. We would organize that food into baskets, and then people would line up for blocks to come and receive food. The Holy Spirit chastised me about that several years ago. When I came back in 2006 to resume leadership of the church, he said, don't do that. I said, what do you want me to do, Holy Spirit? He said, be the church. Nobody needs to see it, be it. We created an environment in our church where nobody makes a big propaganda about giving. We don't get on Facebook and say, look what we're giving. But I promise you, almost every one of you has been a recipient of a giving church like Changing Point Church. What do you mean? Did you ever get sick and have somebody come and give you some food? Did you ever have a trouble paying something and somebody in a life group helped you? We don't advertise it. We don't make a big deal about it. We live it. Does that make sense? That's what God is waiting for the church to do. Live the gospel. Live the breath of God. Live it out. I don't care if nobody watches. I don't care if nobody gets on my Instagram page. I don't care if the media comes. The, the Yakima Herald said, Pastor Moreno, we want to interview you on Friday. I said, come on Monday. I don't have time on Friday. I don't have time to worry about what the media says. There is a father. And when I get to heaven, I want to hear the father say, well done, good and faithful servant. You took in my breath and you gave it out. We need to worry about the breath of God. The world is saying, I can't breathe. And God has entrusted you and me with his breath. Every time you love on somebody unconditionally, every time you help somebody, every time you shut down a critic, a complainer, you're doing it and you're breathing life into somebody who needs the breath of God. Whew, there was a preview in Ezekiel. It was executed on the cross and delivered on the day of Pentecost. And I want to conclude my thought with an amazing reminder in the book of Acts. You know, the Bible says, Bernie, that that day when the Spirit of God fell, that there were people outside the building who couldn't speak the language of the people in the building. Did you ever meet somebody who doesn't speak your native language and you don't know their language? Have you ever felt a burden for somebody you couldn't communicate with? I sit here and I look at this racism and I wish I could pull out a body, a bottle of, we used to call it chango. I don't know if you guys remember. It's that little medication on a stick that my mom would put on the wound and it felt like it was worse than the wound you got. Come on, somebody. It would hurt so bad she would put that on there. And I see people hurting and I wish I could reach in my mom's bag of, of, and begin to heal. But somehow I can't speak your pain because I'm not privy to your pain. I don't know your history. I'm not privy to your history. And I can't speak your pain. So I don't know how. And for me to sit here and pretend that I know how to communicate to you is just disingenuous. It's not true. I don't know how. And anybody who tells you they know how is a liar because they don't know how. Every one of us has a unique pain. Every one of us has a unique experience. But on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says when the Spirit fell, that those who were in the house got a gift to speak a language they were incapable of speaking. And all of a sudden, those people who were hurting and those people who were lost and the people who were wounded but were outside received a word in their language. 
What happens when the breath of God comes? He gives us the ability to minister to people we don't know how. He gives us the ability to touch people that we don't even understand how. I don't know about you, but that excites me. It excites me because nobody has an answer to this problem. And I'm telling you, it's right here in our midst. It's the breath of God. And he'll help you put new flesh on old wounds. New skin on an army because God's going to raise an army. And he's going to do it in this house. I'm saying this house. I got to read this to you. Come on, Jericho. Get up here and make people feel like I'm going to end this sermon. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. So Paul, standing before the council, addresses them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. I want you to notice his verbiage here. I want you to notice, I, want you, I notice that you are religious in every way. I know you come to church. I know you come to church. I, I get that. I get that. And I was walking and I saw many shrines. I see the things that you have done in your life to set up worship. He said, and one of your altars has this inscription on it, to the unknown God, this God who you worship without knowing. This God who you worship without. This God who you worship without knowing. Can I ask you a question? How can we worship the king and have hatred in our heart? How could we worship the king and have racism in our heart? David would say something like this, search my heart, oh God. Search my heart, oh God. Do you know what a racist heart wants? For everybody else's heart to get searched. Pastor, but I'm the minority. I know I am too. I am too. But you know what? So were the Jews. They were the minority, yet God had an expectation for them. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is something that God wants to do us, to do through us, to model to the whole world. Pastor Eli, you're crazy. I don't know, maybe you're crazy. Maybe the word of God is true. And we're the ones getting on here, watch this, worshiping a God? We don't even know. Go to church every Sunday. But get drunk. The first chance you get. Go to church every Sunday. Gossip on your brother the first chance you get. Go to church every Sunday. Still out at the club sleeping around. Am I talking to anybody here? Go to church every Sunday but still love your money more than you love the kingdom. Maybe we're serving a God. We don't really know. Maybe America is the way it is. Because the church is the way it is. He says there's a God you don't even know, but this is the one I want to tell you about. He's the God who made the world and everything that's in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven, he does not live in man-made temples. God doesn't fit in your box. He doesn't have needs that you could service him. He himself gives life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. From one man he created the nations throughout the whole world. And he decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. And he determined their boundaries. When was the last time you made the statement, I serve God this way. I'll go to church if. I'll forgive when. I'll obey if. No wonder, Bernie, there's no breath in the life of God. No wonder the church is powerless. No wonder nobody believes us. No wonder nobody looks at us anymore. No wonder we listen to politicians instead of preachers. No wonder our hope is in the White House instead of his house. No wonder. Because we'll talk about each other, but we won't talk to each other. We serve a God most of us don't even know. How could it be? That I could serve God and distrust you because your skin is another color. I do that. But I'm in church every Sunday. In church every Sunday. I love this next verse. Please listen to me. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God 
and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Though he's not far from us, for in him we live. In him we move. And in him we have our being. I want to free you up to feel your way to the heart of God. You know what that means? I mean, sometimes we mess up. I mean, sometimes we say the wrong things. I'm Hispanic. I could virtually say anything about a white person and get away with it. I get away with it. I'm Hispanic. I'm minority. Hueros, he goes. Nobody flinches. You're a white person who has lived your whole life trying to make things right. You have a moment and you say one thing wrong and we will cut you off for the rest of your life. How did we get here? How did we get here? If you're black, you can't make it. If you're white, you can't make it. If you're brown, you can't make it. If you're Asian, if you're different, you can't make it. All of us, all of us are sticking to our guns. You don't know me. And as long as we're there, we'll never be in one accord. And as long as we're not in one accord, then we'll never have the breath of God. And if the breath of God never comes, we will never heal our country if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray pastor really this is the answer what do you what do you think is the answer moving when a black person comes into your neighborhood that's the answer we're going to move out Tearing up buildings when we don't get our way, that's, that's what we're going to do. It. How about the Hispanic people? Hispanic people, here's what we do. We blow everything under the covers. We just sweep it under the rug. We don't say nothing. They perpetrate us. They hurt us. They do. What do Hispanics do? We just shut up and keep on going. Is that going to heal our country? Is that going to heal your kids? All of us have flawed ways of dealing with this. There's only one way this is going to change if my people will humble themselves and pray. We need the breath of God. We need less PC and a whole lot more BC. I said this to you earlier, but it was the church when Romans would throw away babies with birth defects, the church picked them up. When the Romans would cast out the diseased and the sick, the church picked them up. We were the ones who forgave because we were forgiven. We were the ones who breathed because God, by his grace, breathed on us. Today, I tried to do something that I'm not hearing anywhere in this country trying to offer you something to hold on to. You need a vote. Don't sit here and complain about this country and you didn't vote. Get out there and vote. You need to take care of your responsibilities. Get out there and take care of responsibilities. But I want to know one of you. I want to know just one of you who can make a dead army come to life with your breath. We can't. The only one who can heal our country is the breath of God. And so to the degree that you've been breathed on, breathe on somebody else. To the degree you've been loved, love on somebody else. To the degree you have been forgiven, forgive somebody else. I say this in conclusion today. What if you're the answer? What if we're the answer?
if I showed up at lunchtime and you had one sandwich, would you hide your sandwich in your lunchbox till I left? Or would you share your sandwich with me? Pastor, I only got one sandwich. You know there was only two fish and five loaves of bread? But when God breathed on it, he fed 5,000 people. It's just us trusting him. There's nothing special about the bread. Nothing special about the fish. It was just that it was in his hands. Your generosity, your love, some of us could do with giving up the other half of the sandwich. Come on, somebody. Thank you for the one amen in this house, JC. I appreciate it. Let's love like Jesus loved. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love endures all. Are you ready? Love forgives all. I believe America is going to be healed when the church makes a priority of his breath in our life. I believe that's what he's waiting for. And I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for the breath of God in our house. If you receive anything today, would you stand to your feet and give God a good praise? Come on, just give God a big old praise today.